just discussing those things that bear upon being a home as God would have it. I've said many times, and some of you have heard me say it, that if anything needs to be restored today, it needs to be marriage in the home as God would have it. One of the things, since this is Father's Day, that is so obvious in our nation and has been happening over a period of many years is the denigration of the male and the role that is a God-given, biblically taught role. These things are done deliberately and they're done so subtly that they influence us gradually and not for the good at all. You will notice that for many years now, a man has been depicted as a bumbling oaf. Not that there aren't plenty of them that are, but it's sort of like this. When you teach people long enough that there is no God, and that everything that is came to be over multiplied millions of years of chance evolution. And that man is nothing but a hairless improved ape. Then expect people to begin to act like animals. So it is, when you begin to influence regarding the woman or the man, through teaching and through examples, through movies, through sitcoms, that man is just sort of, well, not much better than an ape, then expect people to begin to view men, husbands, fathers in that light. When you tell a person long enough, he or she is thus and so, then they believe it. And even when they're resisting it, it will have an influence on them for bad. And that's exactly what our country is doing regarding marriage, the home, male and female, husband and wife, and mom and daddy. So we need to restore the home just as it appears on the pages of God's Word. If you also will notice, look at what's happening even between the blurring of male and female. And you're going to see that get worse. Now we're the Lord's church if you've believed in Christ, repented of your sins, confessed your faith in Christ, and you have been immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the remission of your past sins, then you are expected in telling that old, old story to tell the story God's given us in the Bible concerning male and female, husband and wife, and the home established, and the roles of father and mother. And today we want to talk about the father. The Bible gives us very well the picture that the man, the husband, is the head of the family. He is to guide the home. He is to be exemplary in his conduct in the home. And the wife is to help him be not what he wants to be, but what the Bible says he ought to be. And of course, he should want to be that himself, shouldn't he? And he is if he's a Christian. He wants to influence that home through teaching and training and a pattern of life. Now remember, we're not forgetting the wife and the mother, but this is Father's Day. So don't say, yeah, but when it comes to me emphasizing the father's responsibility and then not saying that much about the wife because we're dealing with the father. The father will love his wife even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now that'll, that's a lifelong effort, folks, to be able to do that. He'll love his wife even as he loves his own flesh, for no man ever opposed his own flesh or hurt himself. 
not anybody's right mind. He'll look to the Bible to know what it is to be a father. This is the way God has put the responsibility upon man, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 5 and verse 23. This is, that is the home unit, is the fundamental unit of society. When it goes wrong, society will go wrong. The man is to ensure stability, that is the husband, the father, peace, and order in the home. He cannot do this if he does not know his Bible. If he does, he will not know his Bible unless he hungers and thirsts after righteousness. He can't even love himself like he ought to unless he listens to God from the Bible. He won't love his wife like he ought to unless he follows the teaching of the Bible. Today, marriage is just thrown out the window. And those in marriages many times are in unscriptural marriages contrary to Matthew 19.6 and 19.9. There are multitudes of people who are just living together. That is, they're just living in a state of fornication. And you'll notice you do not hear the words fornication and adultery used much anymore. There's probably more of it today than ever, and so people don't want to be reminded when I do these things I'm sinning. Thus, they do away with God, and they do away with Christ, they do away with the Bible, and look for religions that say, you're all right. And so the idea of, I'm okay, you're okay. Don't be judgmental. I've got to the point where if I hear that one more time, you just want to, I heard Brother Andrew Connolly, the late Brother Andrew Connolly, say one time about something irritating so bad. He said, if I hear that one more time, it'll make me vomit, and please give me direction. What, what goes on in the mind of a person that says, Buddy, don't be judgmental. And what have I just done? How ignorant and stupid have we become that we would judge to show that people aren't to judge? You can't say too much about that to try to awaken people. And so you can expect it to be involved in the breakdown of, of the Father and His work. I say he's to be a pattern, he's to be an example. The right kind of father must be, first of all, the right kind of man. It's impossible to right, be the right kind of husband and right kind of father and not be the right kind of man first. It's an impossibility. Be God's man. How do you do that? Well, how are you God's anything? But to submit yourself to the will of God and the way you think and what you say and what you do. So he must be an example. The first impression of manhood is in the life of the father. There, you know, you only have one first impression <laughs> made on anybody. To the child, the father really is, can do nothing, nothing wrong. I mean, that's who I want to be, the little child does. It's the way it ought to be. But think this morning, right down to the present. People waking up now, it's about right. It's about time for them to get up after no telling what all went on last night. Where, where are the children? They don't know. If the father's waking up, he's got a hangover. He's trying to get straightened out because he has to go back to work tomorrow so he can go through the whole thing all over again and do whatever's necessary next week. You say, well, it's not that many people that way. I'm, I'm sorry there are. A multiplicity of them. Some may not get as drunk and on drugs as others and function better than others, but no, that's the way it is. That's where our country's going. Look around you. You're among some of the best people that walk the face of this earth. I am fully convinced that one reason that America is still holding on, although things can get far worse than they are now and more than likely will, is because of the few godly people in America. But it's all working against the home. 
where is breakfast, some little child saying. Can't get mama up, can't get daddy up. Daddy doesn't know. Well, may not be daddy. The, who is the man in the house this time? He takes an interest in the home if he's a godly father. He takes an interest in the children. It's a personal and active thing. No excuses. No excuses can justify any father in the vital, this vital part of, of life's job. He must stand by the mother to help and encourage her and cooperate with her to fulfill her role as a wife and a mother and to properly train the children. I know that you younger parents hear this probably from some of us who are older more than you realize, but you just have them such a very short time under your jurisdiction and control. In fact, some of you will have a problem someday when they're to be let loose, when they are to act independent of you. You won't want to do that. You may very well create a problem because they could very well find somebody else that they're going to call wife or husband. And how do you deal with that? You're still going to try to handle them like you do at 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8? Won't work if you do. It's going to cause big problems. Father can help a lot about that because, you know, it's not by accident that there are all these mother in law stories. Daddy can put a stop to a lot of things, or in this case, Grandpa, by settling Grandma down. Because there's never been a man worth the price of her little boy or girl. Or girl. Nowadays, I hate to say it, maybe man. <laughs> this story, I think, the greatest story ever told involving the redemption of man has within it then the unit, the basic unit of society, the home. There is where one first begins to understand or respect authority. And if the father doesn't do this, then there's something wrong. But you know, the United States is founded on a government that has authority. Nazi Germany and communist Russia had authority too. But I think there's a difference, don't you? I like our form of government when it's carried out like it ought to be. But I never do want to see a form of government like the Nazi government. And some of us have the idea as fathers that Maybe it ought to be Joe Stalin or Adolf Hitler, and that's the authority. Well, then you have the wrong view of authority. Because that doesn't allow for the care and love of a child. It doesn't allow for the child's own will and own disposition. Raise up a child the way it should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. It's not saying that you raise up a child a certain way, and he'll obey the gospel and forever remain faithful by what you did. Many brethren have confused that. But they don't realize when they teach that, <clears throat> they're teaching, well, there's something I can do that will mean my child will never fall away. No, there's nothing you can do like that because that child's a free moral agent. And that child will do as he pleases or she pleases someday. But you can fulfill your responsibility as a husband to guide the home while the children are there to teach them out of love the responsibility they have to God and to authority wherever it is. In Psalm 127, beginning in verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. A heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is His reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver, full of them. I guess I have to define quiver. It's what you put arrows in. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. I won't spend a lot of time on that, but I suggest you study more what be fruitful means and what multiply means. 
because it can't be carried out that which God commanded Adam and Eve unless you understand what both those mean. And that's as much of an order from God regarding the functioning of a family as anything else there is. He'll love his children. He'll sacrifice for his children. He'll make sure that he can provide the necessities of life for the children. You know, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 14, that parents are to provide for their children. He said, lay up for the children, not the other way around. And Paul said to Timothy, something Timothy needed to know to teach the church. He's a young preacher. In 1 Timothy 5, 8, that a man who fails to do so for his family is worse than an unbeliever, an infidel. It's good to be at all of the worship services. It's good to study your Bible daily and to praise you all. But if you don't do 1 Timothy 5, 8, you're still not going to go to heaven. How are we going to teach our children not to be on welfare if we don't show them the importance of work and providing for them in the divine scheme of things? And we train them accordingly. And we train them to stand up individually and carry their own weight. And to be honest. And to pay their own way. Here a few years ago, I went over to the doctor's office. And it was just a scheduled regular visit. And took a blood test. And when I got into the phlebotomist office, she was upset. There had been a young man about to graduate from high school. And they were visiting. And she was so flustered, I guess, or aggravated, I, I'm putting it nicely, at what he told her. Because he, she was communicating with him about graduating from high school and what he planned on doing. And he was talking about all of the things that he would be qualified for in the way of government help that he was looking forward to getting when he got out of high school because of his age. And it just bewildered her. And also, it ought to, it ought to bewilder all of us. Why would that young person think that way and plan that way rather than plan on learning a trade or getting a job or going to college? Why? Training. Teaching. Others setting an example. Looking for the easy way. Warning it free. There was a time when people had the attitude of carrying their own weight so much they hardly would accept help when they needed it. I don't take charity. But there's a time when you need to. But now we've gone right the opposite extreme. Well, guess who's going to be responsible for allowing a family to go that direction? The one that's the head of the house. The one that is to guide that house. Do you want your children to conduct your, uh, themselves as adults like you do? Fathers aren't to provoke their children to wrath, Ephesians 6, 4, Colossians 3, 21. What does that mean? Well, unreasonable commands. Not recognizing that the child has his own will or her will and likes and dislikes. And those likes and dislikes may not be like yours, even while they're under your jurisdiction. Needless severity, a constant manifestation of anger. And what does that do to the child's psychological makeup? Continually finding fault with them, they lose all courage. They I tell you what you can train them to do is train them to be little sneaks because guess what's going to happen? They'll slip around and do it anyway. They'll just do it trying to hide it from you. And they seem to despair at ever doing a thing to please you. How about providing spiritual training? Discipline. Instruction. Ephesians 6.4. Fathers have the responsibility to do that. Do they do it? Do they instruct? Do they set the godly example I've already mentioned? The Word of God must be in the Father's heart. 
it must permeate him. He should be able to guide things in the home based upon the thus saith the Lord. There are all sorts of examples. I think of Joshua, first of all. That's for me and my house, serve the Lord. He had control. He understood the need of others. Where are our children, or where is anyone, going to learn the need of others and to respect other people and to show that respect? How are they going to learn how to dress? Somebody's not teaching them how to dress because you just see anything coming down the street. Have you noticed that, that, the, that the young girls are dressing exactly if they are of this world, and most are, like street walkers? Look, look at what is the example or the modern vogue of des dressing for the young ladies. It's a shame and disgrace. And you know, slouchiness is the norm. Let's just face it. If it was the right thing to do, I would dress just like some of our members sometimes do when I stood in the pulpit to see how well I got by with that. I can't bring myself to look like something that came out from mowing the yard and stand up here and preach. You know, one time I knew a man who had a job where he wore white shirts and dress pants and slacks all the time. And of course they would get old and he didn't hesitate to go out and put his old shirt on and his old pants on and mow the yard. But when he moved into the country, went back home after retirement, he moved around all those country people, and they all laughed at him because he had on suit pants and a white shirt and mowing the yard. Of course they were old, they were afraid, they were not like he would wear on Sunday, so to speak, or to work. But they were just the old, worn things. But that even engendered, look at him, he's out there more in the yard in a suit. That does seem kind of strange if somebody did that, especially in this weather. Well, think about coming before God. You know, that is who we're worshiping today. That's why we're here. Not here for you, particularly. We're not here, we're here for God. To show him our devotion to him according to how he's prescribed. Well, it doesn't make any difference what you wear when you come to church. You really want to follow that to its ultimate conclusion in every other phase of life. Why did God say to Moses at the burning push, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the ground whereupon thou standest is holy ground. Why? That make any sense to you? Oh, well, that's another culture, another time. They did things in a different way. Well, the truth is the truth. When you come before God, you don't just come before Him in the slouchiest way possible. You dress to the best of your ability. I still remember the times when people wore their Sunday go to meet in overalls on a white shirt with a tie under it best they had. And they were starched and iron. Oh my, what would you young ladies have to do if you had to starch and iron all the clothes that your husband wore? And you had to. I remember it well. All day long. It was ironing day. Well, what does that have to do with going to heaven? It has to do with your attitude. And attitudes makes all the difference in the world as to what you do with your life. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the record of Christ's life, most of what he taught there had to do with your attitude toward God, yourself, and your fellow man. The greatest commandment is to love God with all you are and all you have. And the second is likened to it, to love your neighbors yourself. Now, how do you love yourself? You don't know unless you know what the Bible says about yourself. You can't love your neighbor like God said, love your neighbor. Unless you know how to love yourself. Where are children going to learn these things? Where are they going to be trained in these things? I'm so thankful to God Almighty, and I mean it as seriously and as sincerely and honest as I can, that I had a mother and daddy, especially my mother, who made me dress certain way for certain occasions. Now, I lived at a time we got school, when school was out. Our shoes came off. And they didn't go back on unless we were going to town 
or we went to church. Because I can still remember to this day, at the end of the summer, when I started having to wear my shoes all day long, how my feet took two weeks to get used to them after I went to school. With no air conditioning, by the way, in the school, all my 12 years of school. What does that have to do with the responsibility of the Father? It has to do with what He teaches His children to do and how to act. But they can't teach what they don't know. Do you know that? You say of God's people, my people, as the prophet said, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. What do you think about the home, folks? That's God's first ordained institution. Civil government next and then the church. How can the homes be what they ought to be when the fathers do not know how to be the head of the house? They don't even know what the responsibility of their wife is. How can they help her be what God says she ought to be? So many times they're hindrances. Husbands, fathers, are you a hindrance to your wife being what God commands her to do in order to go to heaven? And are you hindering your children from learning the truth? In other words, are you rearing them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, in the training Training by way of example. This is one reason we urge people when they marry to marry a faithful child of God. That doesn't mean somebody won't, even as a member of the church, fall away. There's been enough of that going on. I don't know how well this fellow's facts are, but a fellow by the name of Keith Merling in a journal called Discipleship Journal, number 49, page 41, said this. When the father is an active believer, there's about 75% likelihood that the children will also become active believers. But if only the mother is a believer, this likelihood is dramatically reduced to 15%. Well, I know from experiences that this has to be close to right. Fathers, what are you being and what are you doing before you become fathers and before you become husbands as to who you're going to choose to help you go to heaven? I've already mentioned the loving discipline of preventive teaching. I've already mentioned the importance of corrective discipline, of care and loving, of training, providing for the family. That all helps us provide and for their destiny. Everybody's going to heaven or hell. Everybody in this room is going to heaven or hell. Everybody in this world is going to heaven or hell. No other places to go. And what goes on in the home is going to determine to a great extent what happens. Fathers, are you guiding your home as the head of your house? Are you learning how to be the head of your house? Let's ask that question. Are you spending time with the Bible, what it means to be the head of your house? Or you got your own mind made up? I told you to take a breath, and you hold it till I tell you to let it out. I told you to jump, now don't. <laughs> don't come down until I tell you. That's your viewpoint of being the head of your house, and you keep it that way. You're in error, you're contrary to the truth. You're not taking consideration of the needs of your family. You're not loving your family. If you're showing them, by example, the importance of studying the Bible, of worshiping, of the importance of submitting to properly constituted authority, to carry their own weight and being an individual and working, then you head down the right road. We're thankful very much for the fathers who've taken it upon themselves to be what the Bible tells them to be. And I can say very frankly that you're going to have times that you're going to think, I should have done this a different way. But don't ever fall into the trap, well, I wish I could do it over again, because if you could do it over again, you'd make mistakes in other ways, even though you got the ones better. In other words, you've got to allow for your humanity in living the Christian life, in being 
a man, a husband, and a father. There is a difference between trying to do right and putting into practice and changing ways that are not good and staying a certain course and in just simply doing as you please. Are you going to train your children about marriage? One man for one woman till death do them part? If not, they're training them one man for one man. In fact, your child may not be a man if he chooses not to be or even a, a, a girl. All that mess going on to make people crazy. Are you going to provide the stability in your home to fend off that? You know, when the English used to say a man's home is his castle, that, that's so true nowadays. You better build those walls with the truth of God all the way around it. And teach your little boys to be boys and to grow up into men, as the Bible defines it. The same way with the girls growing into women. And what the Bible demands of one to be a good husband and a good wife and good parents. And be the examples. It is a lifelong effort. But I'm telling you now, young folks, with babies, and babies on the way sometime, not that I know something somebody else doesn't know. Around here it could be. <laughs> but some people like to really feel those quivers. You just have them such a short time. The old lady said, and I'll close to me one time, we were visiting my grandmother in the nursing home. She walked out to the car with us, and her roommate was there. We had all four of ours. I had one, and I think I was carrying one, somebody standing on my knee, and Jody had one, and there was one you're trying to find out where it is. And she was standing there chuckling at us. And I know she didn't learn this originally, but I've thought of it a thousand times since then and quoted to others. She said, well, right now, they're on your toes. Someday they'll be on your heart. That someday is going to come quicker, you folks, than you realize. Fathers, you play an instrumental part, a basic part that nobody else can fulfill in your family. Your wife can't do for you what God expects you to do. And you handicap her if you expect her to do it. And you stop her from being all God said she ought to be. It's a cooperative effort. Her helping you be God's man and husband and father, and you're helping her be God's woman, wife, and mother. And together, rearing your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Folks, that's the way that's right and can't be wrong. It's the only way we're going to be able to keep ourselves protected for the terrible degeneracy in morals and in the breakdown of the home as it is openly and militantly attacked and even the roles of man and woman, husband and wife, father and mother are fought against. Now are we faithful in those areas? If not, we need to change. God bless all the husbands striving to walk the straight and narrow way of God's authoritative word. And if you're not there, the best way is to become a Christian. One who is of Christ with your past sins remitted and a member of the Lord's church and to live godly lives. We studied a while ago what to do to become a Christian. If you're a child of God and you've sinned, you need to repent of those sins fully and completely. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. May we all resolve to help each other to go to heaven. And one of those ways is to help the home be what God wants the home to be. Are you willing to do that? If so, come while we stand and sing.